often, often in uh, mental health, paradoxes are viewed as a, as, a, as a negative thing. You know, you're this and then you're that. Uh, you could be very detailed, then jump to the big picture. Here it's saying I can be very empathetic and kind and people focus back and also jump at times to being quite logical uh, and potentially, if I'm under pressure, argumentative. And then these are the bits of me that are tend to be lower in terms of discipline driven. I'm not so ordered or down to earth practicality and introversion. And in terms of, uh, uh, of Greta there and Asperger's, you, you often might find typically um, scoring slightly higher on the on the down to earth and the introverted scores. So, but I'll share that research with you in a minute. So that's just to let you know who I am. Just a couple of words about, about Lumina, for those that don't know. We have psychometrics, we measure stuff, we do selection and development. Lots of people do, so what makes a difference? We have smart data, yet simple language. So when we do our research, we like to use uh, what's called a big five approach to personality and gather things that are very uh, low level of detail so that we can come up with some interesting findings, but we always make it nice and simple um, with color and so on in the final analysis. And we fundamentally value different ways of being. So that's why you know, neurodivergence as a superpower is, is central to what we do. Of course, it's not just neurodivergence. We want every form of difference to be measured respectfully uh, and helpfully when we look at personality and not have hidden biases. Um, and at Lumina, we try to do everything virtually. So we say we're effortlessly virtual. So if any of the resources we look at today you need, it can sort of be rolled out digitally in, in the remote world that we now, we now live in. So um, there are really three things I want to leave you with today. And the first is that uh, the personality traits of neurodivergent people actually support many key workplace competencies. Um, uh, we need to nurture the superpower by focusing on strength, not the deficits. Historically, and not even historically now today, often uh, organizations look at the deficit and the downside more than the positive. But of course, we have to make reasonable adjustments to minimize bias, so I don't want to um, sugarcoat it. We need to also consider what to do to make adjustments to make workplaces more um, productive for people who are neurodivergent. So uh, what is it? <clears throat> well, it's simply variations in our thoughts and behaviors, how we perceive things, interact with people. Of course, it's a spectrum. Um, there is diversity in all of us. We will all have some of these traits. Um, when we talk about being neurodivergent, we're referring to people who, um, from a psychiatrist perspective, their neurological development is atypical. So it's typically seen as something that happens in, in childhood. So this is a typical distribution. And you could see it that historically neurodivergence, you could be at one tail or the other. So let's say this was um, extroversion um, and we're looking at the real extremes. Uh, it might be people high in ADHD. Some of them could be really high on, on extroversion. And if we went to say autism, some could be really high on introversion, for example. They'd, we tend to be found more at the tails of the distribution. That's historically how these things are, are taught. A little bit of data. Uh, this comes from Nancy Doyle's uh, rather brilliant research trying to say, well, how prevalent is it? And the gist of this slide is saying, well, the data we've got globally at the minute, I'm pretty sure understates the, the, the percentage of people that are neurodivergent. So ADHD is deemed to be around 5%, maybe more in the US. Uh, ASD, 1% to 2%, dyspraxia, dyslexia, which are the main ones we'll look at today. Um, but I'm, I'm here to say I think the numbers uh, in reality are certainly much higher for all sorts of reasons. Different countries have different ways of getting a, diag a diagnostic. Uh, um, in some countries, you, you literally can't. It's very hard. How do you get the access? And people don't want to disclose these things. So I've been doing research in organizations, and it's it's a fact that many people we research say, no, I don't want to um, uh, say anything about um, neurodivergence. But when we ask them certain questions, it indicates that it is quite possible that they are. So they either don't want to share because they don't trust um, or they're not not aware. So um, this is some of my research from a number of months ago. I have actually got a bigger sample size now, but this was 293 people. Um, surveyed 
in organizations who so went to HR departments and said, can you share this with your staff? Uh, I think the sample size is up at over 500 now. And if you know people that want to do it, we're looking to try and get it up to a few thousand. But 12% of staff were formally diagnosed, but half self-identified with at least one form of neurodivergence. And within this 43%, ADHD in the workplace was the most common one in our research. Um, and that was based on not asking them to declare it, but asking them questions that would indicate it's likely they reach a threshold where they could be um, ADHD. And about one in five uh, were on a similar basis, asking them questions uh, about their personality would indicate they're, they're quite likely um, ASD. So what I'm really saying here now, if we go back to this slide here, is if we just stretch it a bit, um, we should probably use the term neurominorities. <laughs> the people in the middle are a sort of atypical, um, or atypical, sorry. Uh, but actually, it's 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 not just the extremes. It's it's pretty sizable uh, minorities. Yeah, particularly if we look at people that self-identify and haven't had a formal diagnosis. So there's lots of different types of neurodivergence. The ones that I'll focus on today are mainly mainly ASD and um, ADHD, but in our research, we do look at um, others as well. So what are the challenges? What's the value of it at work? Well, typically it's viewed in a negative way. There's a challenge if you're ADHD. This is based on the work again of, of Nancy Doyle's paper in the British Medical Bulletin. You know, you struggle with time management, with concentration and so on, but what's the value? Research does suggest it can make you more creative, better at re reasoning, and you can benefit from hyper focus. And I certainly relate to that in terms of uh, when I did my PhD a number of years ago, it took hyper focus to just clear everything and just descend on one thing passionately um, and so on. And with um, ASD, it's typically viewed that uh, your social communication is difficult. You need routine. It's, it's framed negatively in the literature, but actually it can result in benefits around memory, individual skills can be better, it can also um, help some people with detailed planning and so on, and innovation. And then the same for dyslexia, which is typically viewed as, you, you know, you've got poor memory and so on, your literary is not so good, but actually we know famous entrepreneurs like Richard Branson um, are, are openly uh, dyslexic, it can correlate with higher creativity um, and so on. So I'm here to tell you that there's a hidden bias in many self-report tools out there uh, that can be received very negatively by people who are neurodivergent. And we're going to do a quick interactive um, experiment here. So what I want you to do, if you've got the annotate function on your machine, if you're using Zoom and, and it works with annotate, so find the menu and move the cursor around. For me, it's at the top. Click on annotate and then click on the thing that says stamp and you can see with stamp you can either stamp with a tick so if you think that being bashful is a good thing at work i'm going to put a tick on there obviously i'm asking you to generalize as different workplaces so just think of one workplace you've been in and think would it be a good thing to be bashful if you think it is do a tick if you think it's probably not you're going to do a cross yeah uh, and if you're not sure and you want to express a view, you can put uh, a question mark and so on. And I'm going to run through 20 different words. So we're going to go quick, keep your ticks and crosses around the word, and we'll have a look at um, lots of words and see where we see where we get to. So that's bashful. People are thinking it's not so good at work. What about being bold? Is it good to be bold? You can do so. I'm getting some, I'm getting more ticks there. I mean, Joan's done a big cross on bashful. Okay, untalkative. Is it good to be untalkative at work? What do you reckon? Some ticks are coming in. Some crosses now. Yeah, of course, the answer is usually it depends on the context. But think of a context you're familiar with at work and go and go with that for this exercise. Withdrawn. Is it good to be withdrawn? More crosses are coming in. Thank you all for contributing. Quiet. Is it good to be quiet? Software developers I work with, they like quiet, uh, but people in my uh, sales team, they don't. They like a bit of buzz, so it sort of depends. What about timid? Is it good to be timid at work? 
would you have a positive or a negative association with that word in a work context? Active. Is it good to be active? Do we want active people at work? Looks like there's more ticks. Yeah, reserved. Is it good to be reserved at work? I can see it could help you be more, more diplomatic and professional, but at other times it wouldn't help. So mixed. What about inhibited? Do we want to be inhibited? Okay, there's a mixture of things coming in. Unrestrained. Is it good to be unrestrained? I like to be unrestrained, but it seems to be getting crosses. Not a good thing to be unrestrained. Energetic. Is it good to be energetic? I'm trying to be energetic today. Everyone seems to think it's a good thing. Not everyone. Depends. Unexcitable. Is it good to be unexcitable? You can't excite me. Ticks, crosses, mixture. Okay, a few more words to go. Verbal. Is it good to be verbal? I'm talking here today. I like to be verbal. I enjoy talking. I like speech recognition software. I prefer it to typing. Okay, again, sort of mixed, more cro more positives. Talkative, is it good to be talkative? We like to talk. Okay, and it does, I know these things depend on the on the context. Again, mixed and some love hearts coming in. So some people really love it. I love it. Yeah. Is it good to be shy? Getting some crosses. Assertive. Do we like being assertive at work? Do you have a a positive association with assertiveness at work? On the whole, ticks, the odd cross. Vigorous, just a couple more to go. Is it good to be vigorous at work? Would you like to be, me to be vigorous today? And finally, daring. Is it good to be daring, to take a risk? Yes, it does depend where you work and what you're doing. If I'm jumping out of a plane, I don't want the person that did my parachute to be daring. But if we're doing other stuff in the office, daring could be good. So have a look there. Clearly, some words have more of a positive association than others. I'm going to save that so you can get the PowerPoints later um, and, and be reminded of it. So here's the thing. If I sort them into two lists and I uh, clear the drawings off there, what you'll see is most of the extroverted words that you ticked, certainly energetic, active, vigorous, bold, verbal, assertive, you gave them a lot of ticks. And the ones that you gave the, the crosses to, some of the introversion ones you liked, like quiet, but bashful and shy, timid, withdrawn, inhibited, you tended to say they're not so good. Why is this relevant? Well, uh, a brilliant psychologist called Goldberg back in 92, and he's still doing this research and still going, took all the words in the English language, correlated them, factor analyzed them with literally hundreds of thousands of people over several decades and of all his analysis the statistically the best words for measuring introversion and extroversion the 10 best words for each according to his brilliant research are on the screen so that's interesting that decades of research produces what i would see as more positive words for extroversion and not so positive words for introversion this is relevant for neurodivergence, because if this is replicated in personality measures, in psychometric assessment, it means that somebody, say, uh, with autism, who on average often are higher on introversion, won't feel so great filling in the psychometric tests. And they might, for some of them, find that the way the results are written are, are unappealing. So I'm here to tell you it's a bias. And our experiment here today replicates what I did in my PhD. So I did some quantitative research. And these words on the left got 3.7 out of 5 for how positively you associate with them at work. And the introverted ones got 2.4. And the difference is what's called a, an evaluative bias. The research I'll be sharing with you today, based on Spark, uses different words which are deliberately balanced. So... The extroversion words are still positive, but the introverted words like observing, I choose my words carefully before I speak. That's a positive way of looking at introversion. I'm intimate. I like to listen before I give my view. I can contain my emotions. That's part of emotional intelligence. So we've balanced it. So things are measured very constructively. Um, and that's some research there too, as well. So a couple of things to shape, say before I get into more research on this. Um, and in terms of Lumina Spark, what I'm talking about here 
uh, with this measuring introversion, extroversion. It's called a big five approach. Jung coined those terms introversion, extroversion in 1921, uh, but the modern day way of doing it is more empirical rather than the Jungian model. We're talking about traits. We don't want to type people. Um, in a way, neurodivergence is often from a psychiatric perspective viewed as a type. You've either got it or you haven't. Humanistically, though, we prefer to see things on a continuum with, uh, with traits. I'm going to talk about three personas. So, so far, I've talked about the, the positives in introversion and extroversion. We will talk about one of the personas is how you might get stressed and how your personality changes under pressure. And we do know that has an impact on neurodivergent people. And what I've just described is called evaluative bias. We want to remove this bias where in questionnaires we measure one thing more positively than another in terms of a scale, which can uh, distress people when they have to fill it in and read their report. So here we're going to go a bit interactive. So for those of you that haven't done Lumina before, I want you to find a word on here that you think, you know what, that's me. That's, that's, uh, that's when things are going well, that's me. So I'm going to go for imaginative. Just do this in your head. And then I want you to find another word, which is like if I'm under pressure, maybe it's something I do, but I might overdo it. So for me, I'm going to go for radical. I like to think I'm radical. I'm doing all this great research. But sometimes I overdo it. And sometimes Nicole gives me feedback. You've gone too far, Stuart. Yeah, <laughs> turn it down. So find two words in your head. Someone's put a heart on purposeful and focused and so on. So you can do that now in your in your mind. And I'm color coding them. The color coding shows how they cluster statistically in a big population. So my imagination often does go with being radical and being conceptual. And being purposeful here often goes with being reliable and being structured and so on. So if I now animate this, when I correlate them all in big samples, they tend to cluster together and form the circular model that I shared um, earlier. And this, of course, is the Lumina Spark model. So if we have a look at it, um, some of you will have selected words like spontaneous and seize the moment and be flexible, inspiration driven, go with the flow. As I mentioned earlier, often higher uh, for people that have ADHD, but, but of course not always. If I keep flicking through, big picture thinking, full of good ideas, imagination, Often people who are high on um, ASD are seen to be, you know, they could be dreamers that have ideas and then they jump to the opposite and have lots of detail. Extroversion, you know, wanting to chat, wanting to verbalize. Outcome focus. So sometimes, you know, Greta could be considered to be the positive is outcome focus. She'll speak her mind, she'll speak the truth. Other people might say, oh, it's too blunt, it's rude. That's their perspective. She's speaking the truth. Discipline and structure. Um, again, we know with ASD, often we want things ordered and that boosts our discipline and structure. And there's the down to earth that's the opposite of the big picture. And I'm here to say, you know, moving from one to the other doesn't make you, you know, confusing. Actually, it's a strength. You know, um, Einstein himself had a dream that he was traveling on a beam of light and <laughs> wondered about the speed of the light compared to if he was riding a bicycle, all sorts of crazy stuff. This big picture thinking and then he went down to earth and did the details and so on and he is also a famous person that um, is deemed to be um neuro was neurodiverse introversion which often gets a, a bad a bad rap in measurement and uh and so on and then people focused having empathy and for me this is where i have the polarity i'm quite empathetic and nice but also i can be quite argumentative and to the to the point here is what happens when we overdo it. So my radical turns into change for the sake of change. So I uh, just have a think of the word you chose. Where, where would it have turned up on this mandala? And I'm here to tell you that overextending, you know, sometimes I'm argumentative. Uh, some people in my team become serious and withdrawn. This is part of the human condition. Uh, and it's simply the case that people who are neurodivergent, they may also engage with these overextended qualities, which in certain contexts can be a strength. So we have the bit of us that's underlying, that's sort of the really natural bit we prefer. We have the bit that we dial up every day. 
Uh, and then we have how we might overextend. So why is this relevant? Well, if I can give a real example of a colleague that I work with in Belgium, um, she's in her 40s, and she told me that she was diagnosed with ASD um, some, some 20 years ago. And at work, she hasn't enjoyed her work for 20 years um, because she was always getting feedback. She needed to come out of herself more. She needed to be more vocal. And if you like her everyday personality, she was dialing up her extroversion to fit in, but it was causing her a lot of pain because her underlying personality is more introverted and more disciplined. Um, and consequently, it would put her under pressure and then she would overextend more. The interesting insight for her, when she realized that her underlying personality is high in introversion, high in discipline driven, she's got into a job that totally values that, where she doesn't have to behave in an extroverted way at all. And now she's overextending less and is happier. So understanding who we are, how we rise to things and what we do under pressure is incredibly relevant in this area. So Lumina, we'd like to support neurodiversity, partly through measuring and valuing all different bits of personality, get rid of this bias. And it's not just introversion and extroversion, the bias. There's a bias in terms of, in many approaches at work, emotionality is not really valued so much. Uh, we want everyone to be resilient and calm and not show emotion under pressure. I'm here to tell you that's also an unhelpful bias. Paradoxes need to be embraced and celebrated, not seen as something's wrong. Uh, they, there's great benefit in being able to do seemingly opposite things. We need to keep the jargon out of it and we need to research it. And it needs to have face validity for when people fill it in, particularly if they're neurodiverse. I thought I'd share this with you. I love this. This is called the double empathy problem. It's some research here in the UK just from last year, and it was on autism. And it, it, it's broader than autism, actually, but it goes a bit like this. It says that when you're connecting with someone with autism, there's a double empathy problem. You may disagree on something. Uh, and when you have that disagreement and a breakdown in understanding, if you're working with someone with different dispositional traits, let's say they are high in ASD, you start to attribute the reason why we have a disagreement to them having ASD and them being the problem. So you start to frame it as a deficit. And instead of um, having a proper debate, um, you know, you, you, you attribute fault to the other person. And this paper is suggesting this is what many people do a lot of the time, often unconsciously. So it's not always um, totally deliberate, but they're highlighting this goes on. Actually, this is what happens with any, any typing um, and any judging of other people as well. That's why I don't think typing is a good idea. So if you think I'm this type and you're that type, it can be used to, to defend our positions. So here's a little bit of, of, of research. The papers are down the bottom looking at ADHD. And typically the literature says, well, you're disorganized, you're a sloth, you can be rude, um, you can be a bit neurotic. That's what the literature says, really awful words. Um, and this is typically the sort of way it's described. If you were to have an average splash based on the research, you'd be using all these overextended, not so nice words on the outside, unfocused. You know, if you had ADHD, people would say you're unfocused um, and so on, and you can be argumentative. Much better, I suggest, to look for the positive words and say you're flexible, adaptable, you're, you're logical, you'll speak your mind, and we can reframe it. So the Lumina approach is to say, actually, you're adaptable, you're spontaneous, you're tough, you know, and instead of saying you're all emotional, actually you're quite vigilant, you're impassioned, and so on. And we can do a similar thing with ASD. So again, the words in the literature, and the literature is all down the bottom, are all unpleasantly negative. They can be in the literature, it says you can be more selfish and you can be rude. These are all the negative bits of personality, and this is a typical ASD profile based on that particular research. But instead of saying you're serious and withdrawn and you're detached and you're lost in details, it's better to say you're evidence-based and cautious and more measured, but you have an imagination. This is framing it, of course, positively. Um, and these are the words we'd use at Lumina to positively describe somebody high on ASD. You're observing and you like to be measured. And you're not either or, you can be opposite things. 
So I'm hoping you find that interesting. Um, this next piece of research is looking at SD and ADHD, and it's highlighting that when we looked at competencies at work, we got a group of people, some of who were neurodivergent and some of who weren't, and we came up with some scores for their neurodivergence on a ASD and ADHD using the standard uh, questionnaires that are used to, to, to measure it, so they're reliable and valid. And then we correlated it with the personality scores. And then from our research, we know which personality traits help workplace competencies. And we found that the people in our sample, so this was based on 293 people that were higher in ASD, tended to be good at being evidence-based, observing, measured, and intimate. And in our sample, the people with ADHD were more imaginative, conceptual, adaptable, flexible, and spontaneous. So they've got certain higher qualities. And these are just some of the numbers. And for those of you into numbers, you know, to correlate 0.42 um, between the uh, ASD traits and evidence base, that's a very high correlation in the real world uh, and, and very statistically significant. And then the data for um, ADHD was also, you know, with some really nice, uh, nice, decent correlations. So, uh, if we take that further, how does this show up in people's splashes? So based on our research, in you know, ASD, you'll be more intimate, listening, observing, you'll have imagination, you'll be logical, you'll reason. And that in our research is a typical sort of splash. Yeah. And ADHD, again, imagination, conceptual, uh, and some of the scores up at the up at the top here as well, being very, very flexible. This is a a positive approach. Of course, there are things you're lower on as well. Um, so we're not completely sugarcoating it. Now, if we link it to workplace competencies, we're going to now go from all these personality traits we've measured and say, but how does that impact your ability to have a strategy at work or as a leader, provide direction or be planned and organized? And we have these four color competency domains you know are you a pioneer do you influence people and drive people do you get things delivered or do you perform through people and coach others and and work together so what we found was the people high in our sample on asd tended to get higher scores on pursuing and achieving goals planning organizing holding themselves and others accountable and wanting to analyze data and we also found with adhd um, that the competencies at work that came out higher were that you can adapt to things. Um, in fact, you like adapting to things. You, you, you can want to hyper-focus and learn new stuff. You quite like concepts and strategies and so on. And you can be more creative. Of course, I'm talking on average uh, and so on. I do I know, appreciate that. But I'm trying to highlight here that there are workplace competencies that are supported by neurodivergence. Yeah. So it's a superpower. Uh, the traits of neurodivergent people support many key workplace competencies. But if we review it as a, as a negative, we won't see that. Um, so we need to focus on strengths, um, not on deficits. Um, but we do need to still make reasonable adjustments if we are you know, going into a recruitment campaign and we might want to recruit um, neurodiverse people or uh, we might wish to go to certain organizations that have neurodiverse people. We do need to make reasonable adjustments in the recruitment process to, to acknowledge that. And we may need to make reasonable adjustments in the, in the, in the workplace. So, for example, a friend of mine um, supports an organization where they recruit pretty much exclusively from neurodiverse communities. They're a software development company and their working environment is quite different. They've created um, ground rules for how people uh, uh, behave. And when I went in to see them, they wanted to give me a briefing on the culture I'm entering so I could be respectful to their culture. So it's me that's going into their culture and understand that they work differently in order to be you know, more, more productive. So that's really what I wanted to, uh, to, to share there. We do have, everything I've shared today is is in a paper, but I'm sure Nicole will give you these slides as well. Is that, that right, Nicole? You'll share that afterwards. But if you scan this QR code, which will be in the PowerPoint deck, it'll take you to our 
website and you'll you can get this in a paper and other other papers um as well um so um yeah i've got a question for you so from the research presented so far what recommendations might you have for, for managers at work so i'm going to turn my screen off now and just open it up to um to some questions nicole i don't know if this stuff in the yes thank in, you in the, in the chat or questions that have been emerging but uh, I, think uh, the, I thought we could have some... time to be interactive yeah yeah wonderful so maybe let's just answer this question first It'd be really interesting to get some some people's voices in the room to hear that and then i'll share some of the questions that have come through on the chat afterwards but stuart that was excellent thank you so much <laughs> not at all so what do we think what what advice would we give to managers at work in the light of what i've just shared you can type it into the chat um or you can raise your hand and have the floor or you can just be all um inspiration driven and, and just start speaking so um one key point that louise is putting into the room is around awareness training yeah which i think is a really um valuable point because obviously once we ignite the awareness then it just unleashes a whole conversation discussion yeah. makes it and that is partly the purpose of this talk actually so i'm sharing this talk with uh with lumina learnings practitioners globally actually as a way of raising everyone's awareness whether whether this is their passion or not if you're coaching someone in an organization you need to be aware there could be somebody neurodiverse in front of you and you need to be aware of that and have some sensitivity to it you know mm. uh, is steven saying um some of his concern around self-diagnosis. Yeah, I, I understand that. Yeah, so it's, it is, I think in certain cultures, it varies by country, but you're right, it's becoming a, a badge of honor for some people. I've certainly encountered that in the UK with some people almost overdoing it around ADHD. Um, so I think that that can be an issue. At the same time, here in the UK, it's still quite hard to get a proper diagnosis. Um, uh, and 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 can be expensive and so on and so on um so there's still a lot of frustrated people that that, uh, that are waiting to get properly diagnosed uh, i mean i'm just thinking, even my daughter who's gone through it formally i was quite surprised at the extent of the subjectivity of the questions to in terms of their diagnosis it's, it didn't appear very scientific so we know one has to look at behavior um approach thinking to try and you know identify the extent of the yeah know, the owner and the impact of it yeah um, i mean just i mean offered a slight tangent nicole i i've been interested to realize that many of the clinical psychology tools psychometrically do not have the same rigor that's actually applied in the workplace um occupational psychology is, is much more rigorous i think in its statistical standards yeah. and that's because you know in the workplace we can be sued if we get it wrong um, employment tribunals and so on uh, but it's also because of the of, of the high stakes environment whereas clinical psychologists tend to say well that assessment Nicole that's just one thing I consider and I'm the experts doing the diagnoses so they're retaining the the power but you are right they can look subjective can't they um, I mean I think that's why you're having enough questions so um Jody um, sorry, Jodie's got her hand up. I know she had an interesting um, question around um, sensory processing disorder and its relationship to ADD. Um, Jodie, can you unmute and maybe just share that directly? Yes, thank you so much. So I was just wondering if any part of it was looking at sensory processing disorder. It's also become quite a big thing in the States. And it was part of my thesis that I looked at of adults who are being diagnosed with ADD. A lot of them are actually presenting with SPD. Um, and it's, you know, that overwhelming sense in different environments. And I'm just wondering how much of the workspaces are catering towards that. Um, but the other point I wanted to make is, you know, also coming from a coaching background, it's how aware are we making our HR people and training them to then train the managers in the organizations. Yeah. And I think, you know, around where managers need to be recognizing who how they handle each individual within their team how they cater yeah. to them you know some need the structure some don't some need the micromanagement and it's given them the tools to recognize where people yeah. are different um not just 
pointing them out because you are different and you have a diagnosis or, you know, and I think it's very important to recognize where we're doing the, the training, not just from a person who has a diagnosis perspective, but what are we doing in business to cater for this? Yeah, so I think on the on the latter part, there is a huge task here, isn't there, to educate uh, sort of the HR community globally to be more sensitive to this and to figure out what to do. And you are right, it's not just about identifying and labelling people that have been diagnosed. It's also about all the people that are not diagnosed because they can't get it or they might not even know, but still being sensitive as a HR manager, knowing that there will be a significant portion of my workforce that are neurodiverse and we need to be sensitive and find ways to make them help them be more productive. Yes. Um, so, you know, I'm on my own journey on that. You know, I'm, I am I can tell you 20 years ago, my awareness of these things when I was a manager in a big organization was, was pretty low myself. Um, I'm bringing myself up to speed in the last decade, really, and partly through some of the experiences of my family. Um, if I go to your first point, I think your first point was about people can be quite easily misdiagnosed here. And that can have an impact on, on how they're managed. And um, I think because often um, with many of these conditions, they do sort of correlate and some of the traits correlate, it's quite easy to misdiagnose. So one of my sons was sort of misdiagnosed with um, with depression um, for, for quite a while. And eventually it turned out it was it was ADHD and that made more sense to him. And then the treatment changed and things got better. So it's even for professionals, it's quite easy to to misdiagnose because some of the symptoms look similar. Is yes. that I think that's what you were saying, isn't it? Something like that. Well, yeah. Um, so there is the misdiagnosis, but SPD is becoming quite a big topic at the moment. And mm -hmm. although it's not in the DSM-5 as yet, there's been a lot of work that's been done around it, especially in the States at the moment, where they're using OTs and other methods where yes. you know, it, there's similar symptoms to ADD, but people aren't ADD as such. And that's how they're being diagnosed and treated. And it's not necessarily the right way. Yes. Um, and, you know, yes, around misdiagnosis. But I was just wondering if any of that was part of the research, you know, that it's not just ADD specific. Mm. Yes. Just so um, at the moment, I don't have sufficient data on that but if I get a bigger sample we may be able to look at that because That's at the different. moment I've only really got all the different um, conditions are categorized but at the moment I have only enough data to comment on ADHD and uh, an ASD really so yeah I think the solution to that is is yeah. uh, is to gather more data and I take your point fully. Yeah, be interesting to research that. So there's a few comments here, which is really interesting and I don't quite know the answer, but um, Keith, for example, is, is questioning around the word diagnosis, which is then implying that, yeah. you know, a disease. And with, with all the work that we're all doing, it's all about wanting to normalize um, neurodivergence, neurodiversity. Um, it's even yeah. mentioned here, you know, as someone's um, said in the chat here, uh, Philip Crocker, how does, um, yeah, in terms of how does Lumina look at, okay, forgive me if I'm not conveying it properly, this was a, a, a an ensemble of a few comments here, but perhaps broadening it out to look at the fact that there is diversity across the continuum, whether one is perceived as normal or out of the norm. And it's more about how do we, really connect into where anybody is sitting at any moment in time mm. understanding where they are understanding their needs understanding how to respond so maybe um, this is somehow about and I think that there is a for me a shift going on in the planet right now around like a raising in consciousness that we are getting to a point where we are more respectful of the other and we are able to see actually who are you what are your needs how do we respond how do we activate the value that you can bring, um, mm. you know, in your different, whether it's your qualities or your mannerisms or behaviors. Mm. Um, and, and then going back to this, the, the word diagnoses. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we, are, we are in a in an area where on the one hand, Lumina, and I know you, Nicole, and myself, we're sort of what I would call, we're into humanistic psychology and we're practicing business psychology and we put more focus on on 
positive psychology. So that's the world we live in, isn't it? Um, but when we come to talk about this, we're sort of, in, in a way, we do have to use the terminology that's used in the industry uh, that does refer to disorder and so on and diagnoses. But your point is well made. Um, if we really what we need to do is remove um, some of that language altogether um, if we want to be truly, truly uh, respectful and not, in fact, call it a disorder. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, though, that is what it's called. That's what my doctor calls it and so on. So, you know, that's the reality where you've really got quite different paradigms going on here, haven't you? Yeah. But we, we're all up for for changing the current norms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When it comes to, you know, um, um, I can see Philip's got his hand up. Be interesting to hear your voice, Philip. Thank you very much, and thank you for picking up the point about somebody mentioned uh, enneagram and another one of these um, perspectives, sort of yes. three thousand years old observation predates psychology by a long way. But yeah. uh, just uh, uh, one thought that's come up for me is this use of the word norm and normal mm. um, and uh, diagnosis suggests something's wrong so that yes. it's this binary of it's right or it's wrong and it's just sort yeah. of playing out and i wonder whether uh i appreciate what you said about uh, we need to connect and we need to be understood so we have to use the, the language of the context um and in scientific terms or you know whatever to, to help to be understood but actually i wonder whether you you put a standard deviation um you know norm curve mm. lot, but uh that that's come out from a sort of reductionist materialistic sort of view over 500 years or something and i wonder whether what's emerging is actually that this is natural mm. this isn't anything that's abnormal or normal mm. it's binary it's just natural um and it's it's actually what's being revealed is the revelation of the impact in the context. Mm. So, you know, uh, if I go to, I don't know, a church or something, I'm expected to sit on a bench and be quiet. Mm. Well, there are people who like to jump up and down, you know. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so, but it's, and this thing about respectful. Mm. And uh, to me, the, the honoring the other is, is fundamental here. Uh, and that's actually what we're doing. So it's the bigger, sense of what's going on and what you've done here i think is wonderful is this shining the light on uh on what's really going on so i really just commend it but it was this thing about maybe we could call it natural rather than normal yeah no i think um i think you're right yeah if you say you're normal then what does it mean if you're not normal it's a negative connotation so it's natural again the point i'm trying to make is that um no one ends up falling into that there is, there is a spread and um it's all normal if you like it's all natural um and as you say this is this has been going on for thousands of years before we came up with these labels uh to put some you know negativity on them yeah but that's what also I love about this work or the way that we you know we're not we are so anti the the labeling and it is about if I look at say my my luminal portrait and you're all welcome to complete one um and we'll feedback on that afterwards but the fact that we are tapping into the complexity and nuance of personality we're, we're never one thing and i love that louise is saying here that maybe just taking away the whole concept of labeling um you know what value does that bring let's just focus as she says like the strengths the weaknesses the movement of personality what do we have here and how can we maximize it and just Again, going back to my daughter, if you don't mind. And sorry, Brian, I can see you've got your hand up. I'll come to you next. And looking at how um, she has been to, to nine schools, because I'm trying, I've been on this journey with her. She's only 13 years old. Sorry, I'm spike outside. But trying to find the environment that can really help access her uniqueness as opposed to put her in this box of sanitization. Mm -hmm. And I think that the whole of, from beginning, education needs to change to really understand what's needed to allow the uniqueness and the greatness and the spirit and the mind of kids who like my Oro who's dyslexic and ADHD and all these different wonderful attributes that create huge gifts that she has but it's about the shift so I resist the Ritalin and everything else that says she's got to be on but I do think there's needs to be another level of shift that we're all trying to create at different levels especially you Stuart with your value to bias work and 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 pioneering a lot of this great work around looking 
um, deeper, but it's around there needs to be a shift around the way we educate the systems that we set up that really do allow for this greater, I'm going to call it movement within being human. Mm. So it's a, a thought. Thank you for that, Nicole. I, um, I can see Brian's got his hand up and just I want to just quickly go back to Philip on the, just on one particular point, you know, the normal distribution that, that I shared. Um, I, I appreciate it's a sort of a reductionist uh, technique and so on. Uh, I just wanted to, to share though that what I was trying to say with that was you use that uh, technique back at people that like to use those techniques and say, it's not really the extremes The people we're calling neurodiverse as a superpower. <laughs> it's it's actually not, it's not a um, a minority at all, actually. It's, it's quite a significant portion of the population. I mean, my, my estimate is that really up to up to 50% of people in any work workplace will be neurodivergent in some way, even if only a minority have been formally diagnosed. So that's the point I'm trying to make, yeah. Um, so it's quite natural. It's quite natural, it's normal, yeah, it's natural. Uh, Brian, you've got your hand up, um, the floor is yours. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, I really appreciate this, I've never, really thought about um, the way the neuro neurodiversity is um, is manifested in the um, in the spark. I do most of the work I do is in 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 areas um, with people that do not have access to being able to be diagnosed by professionals. Yes. And uh, what's interesting is that how it does pop up in the um, in the in the spark. And without the diagnosis, um, it allows them to fit within a group in a much um, a much easier way. It, it flows, uh, removing that removing that diagnosis. And in actual fact, what I find happens is that if there are one or two people that have read a little bit about the diagnosis, uh, it, it might even just be a Facebook page or something like that, that actually bungs up the um, uh, the experience or the workshop. Where they try and apply those um, mm. those those labels. So so, I want to thank you. This is enormously helpful. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad it's sparking your imagination and helping us see things. Um, you know, and like the example I gave earlier, my my colleague from Belgium who previously just had a negative connotation with the whole thing, suddenly found in Spark because it represented her introversion and her down to earth in a very positive way. That was the first positive experience she'd had with with psychology and instruments and equally um i work with a colleague in the uk that's that's very high on adhd and and suddenly you know she's hated psychometrics all her life because they've always told her that she's disorganized and unemployable and things like this um actually now now with lumina it's saying well you seize the moment you're entrepreneurial it's framing things in a constructive way that's respectful and that's that's part of it as well um Obviously, just yeah. to be clear, Luminous Spark is not diagnosing anything to do with neurodiversity. But if you are neurodiverse, you will find a very respectful way of being described, um, and you'll be it'll be measured without the bias you would normally get. That's the that's the gist of it. Does that make sense, Brian? Yes, absolutely. So it's, it's interesting that the more the more one knows about neurodiversity and this that it might be limiting. So they don't use those they don't use those labels. They look yeah. at the spark. Everyone works together with a spark, and it actually works. Um, it works uh, exceptionally well, yeah. removing the diagnosis completely. Because um, a conversation, it's more about what do I need? What do I need from you as my team? What do I need from the right. environment so that I can yeah. thrive and and yeah. provide value within the team? Within the team, absolutely. Yeah. We've got five more minutes to go, so I can see we're not um, going to get through all the questions, but I can see Jody. Uh, okay. Sorry, just before Jody, Susan had a really interesting question um, in the chat. What are the ethics around assessing people for selection and development who have been diagnosed, um, for example, schizophrenia? And I'm interested in this because when I use Lumina for selection, often... Um, you know, the manager's interested in looking at their Lumina motion because the question comes to me saying, I want to make sure that they are stable. You know, there aren't any yeah. kind of fluctuations or any issues. So as if they're using that potentially as a screening out. Yeah. So, I mean, well, you I, I'm not a massive that. expert here, but if you were to use a psychometric instrument, and if, if you've suggested there, Nicole, it was going for people that are very stable, 
and it might screen out people or count against people who are say schizophrenic um, the employer would have to be very sure that the, the trait they're looking for, stability, does is actually genuinely necessary for the job, and they could evidence that. Otherwise, they could, you know, somebody could take them to to court or an employment tribunal for being biased. So does that make sense? So um, you you can screen with the, these things and do things that some might consider to be um, discriminatory, but only if there's a very strong case that it links to the role yeah um so i could imagine if you were you know, an air traffic controller or something like that or certain roles you, you it is more acceptable to screen more strongly um around say emotional stability than than others yeah and, it wasn't and maybe, necessary for the job if you're doing it for everything that would be discriminatory yeah and i'm also wondering you know in terms of creating awareness yeah. the more awareness that's created now and this is it's new that we can shift organizations to see the other side, the value, the benefits, you know, that yeah. they're getting high levels of innovation, creativity, solo focus. Exactly. Well, that's why, as I say this, uh, I have a colleague that's you know, involved in the company and every, you know, they're recruiting a huge number of, of, of ASD sort of software developers and creating a whole culture that's incredibly productive for them because they're seeing the value. I mean, that is the most obvious examples. I'm sure there's many other examples. I don't know if Jody still wants to comment. I saw your hand went down. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I I don't mean to just keep uh, putting my hand up, but you know, I, I've got an HR background as well, and I think it depends on the country. But in South Africa, for example, you cannot um, not hire someone based on an assessment or a psychometric yeah. test. Um, so you, you've got to be very careful as to why you're also not taking someone on board. Yeah. So just because they have a diagnosis, you, you can't, you know, regret them based on that. But what yeah. I wanted to also say is, you know, with a diagnosis, sometimes it gives people comfort because they felt different their whole life. And sometimes it just makes them feel like, okay, now I know why I'm different. But then they can also get the tools to use in a positive way of, okay, I've been different. How do I become more structured? How do I do these things? So mm. I, in, in my practice, I don't like to use labels just to give someone a label. It's like, okay, there it is. We park it on the side, but now we look to where are the strengths? How can we make it positive? It's not to say that this is who you are and it's not to define you as a person. It's mm. really to say, okay, that's in the background. How do we work with it? And I noticed Stephen had, had put a comment about a bipolar colleague. Some of the strongest people I know as well have some form of diagnosis. Mm. And mm. just because we do doesn't mean we any less or no better than anyone else. Um, and I, I really just think the awareness is that we create a, a, a more positive environment for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so where people are talking about diagnosis and labeling being very negative, I also think it can be quite positive for those that have had things and they don't actually understand why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's certainly the case for, for two of my sons who are um, neurodivergent in different ways. They both felt a huge sense of relief with the diagnosis, so they're quite happy with it. On the other hand, they don't necessarily want everyone to know about it at work and so on in case... Yes, you know, but you don't have to go and scream it to yeah. everyone and tell everyone. It's yes. for you to work through, I think. Yeah. And I'm I'm left feeling right now actually really excited because I feel that there's a shift happening and you know previous you know, take even five years ago one couldn't say put their hand up and say I'm bipolar because they'd be worried that they wouldn't get the job opportunity or that they would be um you know biased against in some way and I think you know with all this kind of blurring the lines the value of this that's come through is let's really embrace difference in a in a sincere way let's open our eyes let's see what exists here and then we've got the very um structured approach around saying you know everybody has unique skills and talents let's have a look at those let's see where yours exists how can we amplify them let's not hide that you know within for all of us whether you are you know neurodiverse or not we've all got strengths and weaknesses anyway but let's understand those those weak spots or those um, development areas and you know do we need to 
just delegate them out or do we need to transfer and, and develop them because they are sabotaging our success? Yes. So it's the same conversation actually for every individual, but the work that needs to be done is creating awareness, mm. both for within the organization so that they can not be biased in terms of who they select and bring in and, and mm. make the value across a team, but also from the individual perspective to step into their power and to access their voice and confidence around who I am to own both sides and say, you know, it, it's all for me around kind of being confident and brave to be able to say, this is what is yes. what I need. Nicole, we're, we're actually at time and I can see a few people are needing to, uh, to go. And I know there's more questions we could answer, but I suggest we do draw it to a, to a close. Is there anything you, you, else you want to say, Nicole, like about offering people a free? Yes. Well, uh, yes. First of all, just to thank you, Stuart, so much for, for your time. I know how busy you are. I really appreciate and, and always love hearing about your latest research. I know you're working on other things. So I'm going to pull you back and invite everyone to your next, next talk. I'll be um, back. Yep. Uh, in terms of today, I will share um, the slide that you're going to share with me, also the chat, because there's so many interesting perspectives from everybody that shared today. And we will be sending um, the people who are not already um, Lumina practitioners here um, a link to complete your Lumina Spark portrait. Um, if you are interested in the deep Lumina emotion, then we can um, provide that as well. Um, and yes, thank you so much for your time and really fantastic conversation. And let's all get out there and, and create more awareness around this really yeah. vital topic. So thank you. Thank you for inviting me in and thank you for everyone's time and attention today. I really, really appreciate it. And I'll, I'll send you a research link as well if you want to yes, please. Uh, contribute to the research and look at your own neurodivergence as well. Um, we'll give you a link to that too. Yeah. So thank you, Nicole. And thank you, everybody. Have a really, really great rest of week, everybody. Take care. Thank you so much. And thank Bye. you, everyone, for being here. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye, Anisha. Thank you. Bye, Bye Glynis. Ah, oh, Rain, are you here? I didn't see you. Hi. I was a bit late, very late. Uh, okay, <laughs> fantastic. Is there going to be a recording that's available? There is. In fact, I'll stop the recording now, but I will send it to you. Okay, very good.